What's up everyone? For those of you who don't know, I have been doing research for the past over a year now on breast cancer in the School of Medicine at UCI. Um, it's biochemistry research and as part of my chemistry degree, I can actually do a final thesis program where you do at least a year of research and present about it, write a thesis and give a full presentation. So I just finished that presentation and I'm going to show it to you now. It is a little bit long, but I did try to, I tried to really explain um, like the details of everything that's happening, go through the mechanisms. Um, so it is, it is pretty science heavy, but I think for the most part, you should be able to understand it even if you don't have too much science background. Um, but yeah, here's the presentation. Enjoy. Okay, so now we're gonna have something uh, completely different. Um, of course, medical scientists are very interested in what genes cause what. And uh, as Zach is gonna tell us, uh, it could be more complicated than people thought. And because proteins interact with these genes and turn them on and off, and uh, he's going to tell us the research he's done along these lines. All right, hi everyone. My name is Zach. Today I'm going to be talking about TRAP 150, which we've identified as a binding protein to BRCA1. So before I go into what TRAP 150 does, first of all, what is BRCA1? Um, it's a tumor suppressor gene. It's very involved in DNA damage repair. And there's been extensive research done on BRCA1 since like the 80s. We know a lot about it. And actually we've developed a screening. You guys might have heard of Angelina Jolie, right? Um, she actually got a screening uh, that identified a mutation in her BRCA1 gene, which gave her an 87% chance of developing breast cancer and a 50% chance of developing ovarian cancer. And she actually lost her mother, grandmother, and aunt to cancer. So the reason I share this is just to show you how important of a gene BRCA1 is and how much it can give us a much higher chance of developing breast cancer if it's not functioning properly. So <clears throat> previously, it's been known that TRAP150 is a candidate to be a binding protein to BRCA1, but other than that, there hasn't been a lot of research done on TRAP150, and we figured in our lab, like, since this protein interacts with such an important regulatory protein, Maybe it does something too. So we might want to look into it. So here's some questions that we investigated. What parts of TRAP150 binds to BRCA1? Does BRCA1 regulate TRAP150? If so, how does it regulate it? Um, and then most importantly, how are these regulations important to the cell? So how do they affect uh, DNA damage response, cellular differentiation, and how can we apply this discovery? So before I go into um, what our research was, I just want to go over some uh, biochemistry methods because not all of you are biochemists. So the first thing is um, we were able to amplify our plasmids using something called XL1 blue supercompetent cells, which is a bacterial cell line. And essentially, uh, we can use bacteria as a factory to clone our plasmids. Um, so <coughs> this cell line specifically is very good for routine cloning. Second, we used the 293T cell line, which is a human embryonic kidney cell. And we use this to basically produce our lentivirus. So it's actually pretty cool. What we could do was add um, the, the protein head of a virus, the tail part, and then our specific DNA that we wanted. And we would add it to this 293T cell line and the virus would infect those cells. And then we can then harvest that virus because it'll reproduce itself. Um, and then we can use that to perform deletion analysis experiments. So what that means is we would use our lentivirus expressing short helping RNAs, which are able to um, conduct RNAi. And that we can use to knock down BRCA1 or TRAP150. Finally, we use um, the MCF7 breast cancer cell line to basically test how BRCA1 re re uh, regulates TRAP150, and we also did Western blots. This is a typical analytical technique uh, where you can run proteins down a gel and detect for the presence of specific proteins. So in the following slides, you're gonna see a lot of gels that help us identify what proteins are present and interacting. 
Also here is the general form of a plasmid. So right here in the blue is our gene, which we can actually manipulate. We can order different plasmids that have different genes that we want to study, and we can induce certain mutations and things like that into them. We keep the rest of it, especially the primer, um, and the bacteria will just replicate it as soon as we introduce it. We also use something called GST. So here's an example of a plasmid we actually created. Um, where we, in, uh, we introduce GST, which is an affinity tag. And so what this protein does is if we confuse GST to any, any protein of interest, we can now easily isolate that protein because GST is an enzyme and it's very good at binding its substrate, GSH. So we can easily isolate our protein by fusing GST to that protein. Another cool thing I want to point out is right here we have AMP-R which is ampicillin resistance. So this is also a common technique in biochemistry. We can now grow our bacteria on an ampicillin plate, and all the bacteria that don't have our plasmid will die because ampicillin kills bacteria. Um, and yeah, so GST is frequently integrated into expression vectors for this reason, and you will see on the next couple slides that we uh, use GST to isolate our proteins. Here's just a little picture of GST. I also wanted to point out it's very small. It's about 20 kilodaltons. The proteins we're working with are 200 to 300 kilodaltons. So adding a little tiny protein on isn't gonna make a big difference. Another thing I wanna point out is this thing called the BRCT domain. So BRCA1 has something called a BRCT domain, which previous research has found is very important for its binding and function with other proteins. However, what's interesting is that this domain is conserved throughout many proteins that carry out the same functions as BRCA1, that are involved in DNA damage repair, cell checkpoints, things like that. So um, the first thing that we actually wanted to test was, does TRAP150 bind only to BRCA1, or does it bind to other proteins that have the same BRCT domain? So what we did was, again, we used GST fuse to our protein of interest, and right here is what a Western blot will look like when you run the gel. So on the left is our marker, which will tell us kind of the, um, how big the protein is. So GST by itself is a very small protein, so it'll be able to go pretty much all the way down the gel. So it's not very inhibited. And then as we add, um, as we fuse it to bigger and bigger proteins, you'll see they won't travel as far. So right here, um, 53 BP1 and MDC1 are proteins that also have the BRCT domain, but very interestingly, do not bind to TRAP150. So here we have stained the gel with a TRAP150 antibody, and we find that it only shows up on our BRCA1 um, protein. We also, as a control, we added the BRCA1 mutant. This is actually the mutation that Angelina Jolie has, where a methionine is changed to an arginine in the BRCT domain region, rendering it useless. So we wanted to make sure that TRAP150 cannot still bind to BRCA1 if the BRCT domain does not work anymore. So after that, we now want to see, well, what happens if we knock down BRCA1? What happens to TRAP150? So here the gel, um, you can see on the left is the control, and then we have five different shRNAs. So Remember, shRNAs are what can conduct RNAi. They, they essentially chop up the mRNA responsible for coding for BRCA1. So we used five different ones just to make sure that it was actually working. And we saw a uniform response was that TRAP150 levels decreased. We also tested for this protein called RB, which is retinoblastoma protein. And the reason that we tested for that is because RB can tell us about the cell cycle. So if we look at our control, RB has this higher region right here that tells us that a lot of cells are in the S phase, so they're replicating. Now, when we knock down BRCA1, we don't see that S phase anymore, which means that the cells are growing more slowly when BRCA1 is knocked down, and TRAP150 levels also decrease. And then finally, P48 is just a living control. So, now that we've identified that TRAP150 levels correlate with BRCA1 levels, we want to know, is this binding interaction dependent on phosphorylation? So what we did, we again ran a gel, GST fused, and we, we did two tests of BRCA1 right here, and then the BRCA1 mutant as a control again. And what we saw was very interesting. When we treated the lysate with a phosphatase, 
So a phosphatase will dephosphorylate the protein. When we treated BRCA1 with that uh, phosphatase, we saw that TRAP150 no longer uh, binds to it, showing us that uh, this binding is phosphorylation dependent. So now that we know it's phosphorylation dependent, which part of TRAP150 binds to BRCA1? So the way we designed this experiment was we basically chopped out three sections of TRAP150, and this is the plasmid we created. So here's our delta N region, our delta M, and our delta X. So N stands for the N terminus, M for middle, X for N. So we created three different plasmids with each one gone, and also I wanted to point out some cool things that we added to these plasmids. So one is we added uh, GFP, which is a fluorescent protein. And that allows us to make sure that our plasmids are actually entering the cells. And the way that we can do that is by looking at them under a fluorescent microscope. If we see green, that essentially means that the plasmid has successfully entered our cells. Uh, we also added an HA antibody right here, or sorry, an HA tag, which uh, we can then detect using an HA antibody. So the purpose of adding these two things is in biochem, we always want to double check ourselves that we're actually analyzing the protein we want to analyze and not something else. Um, so those two additions make it easier to sense that. And then also, this part's really cool. So we added SV40 NLS. NLS stands for Nuclear Localization Sequence. So we know that TRAP150 interacts with BRCA1, and they carry out their functions in the nucleus, right? So when we introduce our protein, we need to make sure our protein is actually going to the nucleus. So by adding this nuclear uh, localization sequence, this sequence can bind to important, which is a protein that can transport our protein of interest through the nuclear envelope into the nucleus. So by adding this sequence, we are ensuring that TRAP150 is able to enter the nucleus. <clears throat> so here are the results. We find that the delta X region at the very end is the region where uh, TRAP150 must be binding BRCA1. So now that we've identified an overall region, we want to see if we can identify a specific point mutation. So what we did was we changed a serine to an alanine. The reason we did that is serine has, an, has a hydroxyl group, which can be phosphorylated. Alanine does not, but it has a very similar um, size to serine, so it won't mess up the overall protein structure. And um, we actually had to choose, so I think Sierra was asking me this question last week. I thought there was only one serine in the delta X region. It turns out there are four, but only one of them has the SXXF uh, makeup. So basically that means we have a serine, two amino acids, doesn't really matter what, and then a phenylalanine. And this has been shown in previous research for uh, proteins like TRAP150, this SXXF is what is usually the phosphorylation site. So lucky for us, there was only one SXXF right here. Um, so we induced a point mutation there. And I'm gonna go over how we did that. So here's just a list of all the different primers we used. We also tested some, uh, some different mutations in the delta N and delta M regions as well, because we know that those are also involved in the DNA damage response. So we're actually still currently waiting on results for this experiment. Um, but I'm just gonna explain real quick how, how we made these mutations occur. So we, right here we have a uh, green and orange is our wild type plasma from the bacteria. And what we did was we take primers and we have the, the mutation put in. So to change from a serine to an alanine, we need a two base pair change. So we've created primers that have this two base pair change, and when we run PCR, uh, we have primers going on both sides, you can see right here. And basically we're able to make plasmids with our desired mutation by just running PCR with our, um, with our primers. Now, you might be wondering, okay, well, we've created the plasmid we want, but we still have this wild type um, DNA present, right? And we don't want the properly functioning TRAP150 protein, we want our mutated one. So what we do is we add this uh, protein called DPN1, which is a digestion enzyme. And the reason we add this is, if you guys remember from biochem classes, when, when bacteria replicates its own genome, it methylates the DNA. But when we do PCR, the DNA is not methylated. So DPN1 targets only methylated DNA and chops it up 
and makes it unreadable to the bacteria when we reintroduce it. So now we can successfully transform just our DNA, which is what we've done, and we're still waiting for the phenotype. So from, <clears throat> from this research, we can make a couple conclusions. One is CRAP150 is definitely a binding protein to BRCA1, and it is phosphorylation dependent. Two, um, TRAP150 expression levels correlate to BRCA1 levels. So as we saw in that experiment when we knocked down BRCA1, TRAP150 levels also decrease. This leads us to an interesting hypothesis. So we think that the reason TRAP150 levels decrease is because when, so in the cell, when a protein isn't being used, um, it's labeled with something called ubiquitin, which is a protein that essentially tells um, ubiquitin ligase that, you know, we need to chop this protein up, we don't need it anymore. It's not serving a purpose. So um, to recycle kind of, it. Right, to yeah. recycle it, clear up clutter kind of thing. So we think that if BRCA1 is not present and TRAP150 is not able to be phosphorylated, then it's most likely degraded. And that's why we see the decreased levels in TRAP150 when we knock down BRCA1, because it needs BRCA1 to function. Um, so this data suggests that TRAP150 is a substrate of BRCA1, and so our future directions would be actually demonstrating that TRAP150 is indeed a substrate through in vitro analysis, which is something we're working on right now. And then we also want to show, like, we want to show the overall significance of this TRAP150 BRCA1 interaction, so we want to know what genes exactly does TRAP150 regulate because we know um, that its overall function is to aid uh, BRCA1 in splicing and mRNA.